Welcome to Permission to Kick Ass, a podcast about leaving self-doubt in the dust, punching fear in the face, and taking bold action toward your biggest dreams. I'm Angie Coley, and let's get to it. Hey there, it's Angie, and this is a first in the Permission to Kick Ass show history. So today we've got a little bit of a special episode for you because my guest Richard Blank and I had technical difficulties the first time we recorded, which resulted in, I I don't know what happens, but the recording cut out at about 20 minutes. And then we did a follow-up interview and wound up stitching them together. So in this episode, you might hear a couple of references to something that happened earlier in the conversation and think to yourself, wait, they didn't say anything about that. So that's part of the stitching together process. But I listened to it and I love this episode and I love Richard's energy. And I think that you are going to love it too. So thanks for sticking with us and uh, enjoy the show. And welcome back to Permission to Kick Ass. With me today is my new friend, Richard Blank. Say hi. Angie, so happy to be here today. Cannot wait to share ideas with you and make things happen. I'm so excited to talk. Like, I just love your energy already because before we hit record, right, I'm I'm holed up in this hotel just outside of Portland and Stella is walking through the background and Richard was like, who's the kitty? Let me see. Just such good energy to start the show. Anyway. Anyway, tangent aside, tell us a little bit more about your business and what you do. Well, my name is Richard Blank. I'm the CEO of Costa Rica's call center. We're a bilingual, dedicated, nearshore call center in Central America. And we handle uh, customer support, lead generation appointment setting. And we're almost celebrating our 15th year in business. So my friend, I'm living the dream. I have a luxury trade and it's been a great 22 years I've been living here in Costa Rica. I know. That's awesome. We were talking about that before recording, too, because you showed up nice and sharp and the pressed suit and the tie. And I'm I'm in case our mothers show up. I got to be ready. (laughs) It's like I'm over here in my tank top because it's a heat wave right now. But I was like, oh, wow, I'm so impressed, man. I feel so good. Such a sharp looking guest. Uh, Like ZZ Top said, every girl crazy for a sharp dressed man. So how did you that's an interesting business. How did you get into the call center business and in Costa Rica? No, no less kind of fell into it. When I was 27 years old, a very good friend of mine asked me to come to Costa Rica to work at his call center for a couple months just to teach English. And a couple of things, if you can get past your parents' guilt, Angie, you can live anywhere in the world. <laughs> and when that barn door was open, I wasn't coming home. I moved to Central America to paradise. And one day turned into a week to a month to a year. Mm. And did I know that I would be married, I'd have a business, living in paradise. And so a lot of the times you're given opinions and people will pressure you for Mm -hmm. predestined careers. And when I graduated high school in Northeast Philadelphia back in 1991, I decided to double down on languages. So this just didn't happen overnight. I was building on the momentum that I started when I was 18 years old to really believe in myself and to go for a career which would fulfill my needs. I just didn't want to, Angie, I just didn't want to forced fit. I was willing to walk alone and be this sort of dreamer. And so I was prepared for this. So when I came to Costa Rica, I realized I could shed some skin, start anew and have a second life. I love that. I love like all of the energy behind that, all of the thinking behind that. Cause I, I just, I, you know, I wouldn't change anything really looking back in time at all of the steps. I really do believe all the decisions that I've made have led me to this moment in time and us talking right now. But Mm -hmm. if I had had the confidence when I was that age, when I, when I was 18 to just go out and do what I want instead of what I'm supposed to do. I feel like life would be incredibly different. I hope it would be different for, for the positive versus the other way, but it's interesting to me how indoctrinated we can be just growing up in this capitalistic society of this is what you're supposed to do. These are the steps to follow. This is how you find your happiness. And I'm like, there's, there's 7 billion of us How on earth is there one path to happiness for 7 billion people? If that were true, wouldn't we already all be there? Of course. It reminds me of Pink Floyd, The Wall. I just don't want to be nameless, faceless, and walking into a meat grinding machine. I... There was a couple arguments that I made towards it. My grandfather went to Harvard Law. My dad went to Columbia Business. My brother at Washington and Lee University. 
My friend, I no more had the grades for it, the structure and the disciplines. We had to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And secondly, my great grandparents came over from the turn of the 20th century from Eastern Europe. They moved to New York. They were tailors. They learned English. They were entrepreneurs. So even though it skipped a generation or two, I was pretty making my argument that we're nomads, mm -hmm. that we take chances, we take risks, we follow. I could have always clicked my heels and come home and had everyone told me I told you so. But guess what? The long shot paid off. Yeah. And I realized that when you're on a vision quest, a spiritual life journey, there are things inside of you that make you gravitate towards certain decisions. So I just didn't want resistance, Angie. I really wanted to live a very true life. So mm -hmm. at least I can look in the mirror and, and respect myself for the decisions that I've made. Absolutely. And I think that's so wonderful. And I want everybody listening to just take note of that. That's not something that uh, this is probably going to come out the wrong way, but I think, you know, the spirit in which I mean it, like, that's not a, like a special trait that's only reserved for certain kinds of people. You can, can, you can cultivate that desire to be true to yourself, to follow your own comfort compass. It's not like a, if I wasn't born with it, well, then I'm just meant to be a cog in the machine. I believe everybody listening to this show was meant for more. Otherwise, why would you be listening to a show called Permission to Kick Ass if you didn't believe that you could go out there and kick some ass? Am I right? The permission is for yourself. I exactly. don't need anyone else's permission to do this. And also, Angie, I was doing things with good faith and mm -hmm. good intentions. So regardless of the outcome, I know I could live with myself on something. And, and language is just opened so many doors. And I was getting a lot of positive reinforcement. I was building momentum, mm -hmm. got recommendation letters from my principal in my high school to assist me in getting in college. So I, I'm just trying to pay it forward, you well, know, kind of like the me today, you tomorrow. And by owning a company and being a CEO, really, I focus on how many families can I feed, not how much money can I put in my coffers. That, that's not the most important thing for me today. I love that. I think mission driven business is the way of the future. Like we've seen what happens when things kind of grow out of control, unchecked. But I think if you're focused on the people that you serve, your customers and your clients, if you're focused on the people that work for you and creating a great supportive work environment, helping them get to the next stage, whatever the next stage might be, that everybody winds up working together to invest in this company too. And we all grow together. That's, that's always been my philosophy anyway. And Angie, we're dealing with individuals that are bilingual, so mm -hmm. they're getting a return on investment of their education, but I can expand on those skills. I can give them their self-confidence and self-reliance. And since English is my native tongue, I can work with their vocabulary, the delivery and diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So they're really building their skills. And the best part is bringing someone in that's never worked at a center before. So you and I can mold them. They can be a, a squire to a knight and not <laughs> bring in bad habits or be a cancer or a jumper. Yeah. And so we create, a, it's a very organic environment here with a lot of synergy nice. and people work with me so I can give them their dignity. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest cracked code. If you're looking to scale and have people work with you mm -hmm. is to once again, give them that sort of, uh, their dignity, knowing their name so they don't feel expendable. It's mm -hmm. just as simple as that, Angie. I love that. I mean, I, I work with someone uh, who she hates when I call it this. Uh, it's like a mastermind group, but it's group therapy for entrepreneurs because it's run by a psychotherapist. Uh, okay. And we've talked a lot about like running business, having hard conversations in particular with employees, mm -hmm. with contractors who might have let you down, with clients who have expectations that are different. And like you, you want to preserve that relationship and you want to get paid because you got bills to pay. So how do you have these hard conversations where somebody might get hurt? And dignity is what keyed me into that because she says you've always got to be focused on giving people a dignified way out. And like that accusatory way of telling people like you're wrong, I'm right, doesn't mm. give anybody a dignified way to back out. And you got to give yourself a dignified way to back out, too, because sometimes we're in the wrong. You know, that's a little bit of a tangent, but just that word dignity really caught me. Like treat people with dignity, with care, with respect. It's not nearly as hard as it might seem. I don't know if you ever saw this movie called Ever After. It was one of my favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and at one point, the prince says this line of like, I used to think that if I cared about anything, I would have to care about everything. And then I would go stark raving mad. And I think a lot of people live their entire lives under that impression that if I care about something, I'm going to have to let all of the world's troubles in and then I'm just going to like lose it. But I 
I think that you can be a deeply caring, deeply giving person, a very successful entrepreneur. You can prop up the local economy. You can support people. You can make an excellent life for yourself without losing your minds. Like all of that is possible. My suggestion, it's impulse control and maturity. Mm. There's no sense of urgency. If you do not need to give a final answer, right, right, right now. If you're allowed to walk away, sleep on it, write the draft, read it the next day, maybe not send it. There's a very good chance, my friend, we can eliminate what's not necessary, prioritize, calm down, rehearse how you're gonna make the diplomatic delivery. And once again, not come out guns a blazing, possibly mm-hmm. understand someone's position yeah. and really be able to represent yourself in the best light, especially if something's emotional, sensitive. You don't wanna ruin Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. But if, if given the chance, to ponder, to organize my thoughts, to hit the gym, to take a walk, to play some pinball and think about these ideas, I've been able to maintain certain relationships compared to just a one and a doneer burning a bridge. But mind you this, Angie, you know, a lot of people have situations that are happening outside of the office that might be affecting their work performance. Now, without prying or going home with you, Mm-hmm. I have to take that into consideration because I can give them a little Philly guilt. I can say, hey, Angie, you know, you're better than this. And come on, you're out of character. Look what you did last Tuesday. You were the star. And today you're a zero. What's going on today? Mm-hmm. And so I, I can really get real with people because I've been there during their good times and added wind in their sails. And, and maybe you and I could be the first mentor, teacher, mm-hmm. partner that actually is a straight shooter. Yeah. I don't want a yes, man. I want someone on my team, mm-hmm. but someone's got to tell me if my coffee's too strong, <laughs> you know, yeah. at least if you can play with me. And, and I respect people like that. They're, they're more than willing to be open-minded, not being vulnerable, but willing to really let themselves be true mm-hmm. so we can build an honest relationship together that's long-term. Absolutely. I think that's super important. Like a uh, I, I, two things that really stuck out to me there was like giving yourself space, like how many relationships and, and disaster relationships ending and disasters could have been prevented if the people involved felt like they could actually take space to respond. Like, I can't tell you how many times once I learned that I used to be a hothead, I'm sure permission to kick ass didn't tip you off to that I mean, look at, at the all. name of the podcast of course <laughs> yeah angie i used to blow up i used to have a very like direct fighting style of like let's hash this out right now and just move beyond it and as i learned this art of patience i learned how often just me leaning into the emotions and and deciding that i needed yeah. to solve this right now actually escalated things to the point that w- there was no coming back from it and half of the time easily If I do take that pause, by the time I've come back around to articulate my response or ask for a call, they've had some thoughts and come back and propose something too. And like the situation resolves itself almost. So like patience and take a space, it's totally okay. And I don't think anybody, anybody rational anyways, uh, has a problem with you saying that's fantastic. I love hearing that. Or Ooh, like that's, I'm struggling with that. Could I have 24 hours to think about that? I'll get back to you tomorrow. Most of us are going to be like, yeah, that's fair. Cool. Let's talk tomorrow. Non-issue. <laughs> You're hundred percent correct. And, and as I mentioned before, writing down these ideas, sharing it with somebody that might be outside of your circle. Sometimes the best advice you get are from bartenders or strangers on the train. Mm -hmm. So you just don't want to be prejudged on something like this. You might need to get it out with another group that has absolutely no idea what you're even talking about, just to see if your tone is off, if you're being Mm -hmm. too aggressive. Those are the ones that I think can point out exactly what you said. Like maybe there's something going on at home. To me, that's kind of the the impetus behind people always saying it's not personal, it's business. You know, it feels personal when it's your business and when you work so hard on it, but like maybe everything went wrong. I was telling you a little bit before we started recording that I had a mother of a bad weekend with a horrible Airbnb experience. And like, I'm in a hotel right now. Um, And it's very easy when you're surrounded by those circumstances and all of that energy and that frustration to like somebody sends you an email and you read it at the exact wrong time and you go, not this shit right now. And you snap. Angie, it it, it really depends on how you react to it, not what Mm -hmm. happens to you. My favorite thing is the movie Zorba the Greek. 
with Ooh. Anthony Quinn. The man's fishing boat sinks, and instead of crying or screaming, he just puts out his arm and starts dancing on the beach. It's one of the greatest, <laughs> one of the greatest lessons in life you could ever learn, mm-hmm. how you react to it. And I learned to smile a long time ago. And I don't take things personally because sometimes in this world, there's a zig and a zag. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. I'm willing to take that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, my toes are still tapping. And that's the most important thing, Angie. I love that. And that's a choice too, because I wouldn't say that I grew up feeling like a very positive, a very power empowered, a very um, understanding or compassionate person. I was very judgy. I was very convinced that there's a right way, wrong way to do things. And like, if you just did things my way, things would turn out better. Stop arguing with me. Um, (laughs) And just open, but I, I lived a life of kind of misery and frustration in that mental state because Frankly, I was trying to control a whole bunch of shit and a whole bunch of people that I can't actually control. Mm -hmm. I can only control me. And when Mm -hmm. that light bulb went off in my head, I can only control me. There's nothing about the rest of this situation that I can really control. Me and my actions, that's it. That really helped me to understand the compassion and realize that. So like you and I were looking for the for the positive stuff at this point when things go wrong and we're going, all right, this ain't going to hold me back for long. Let's just find the thing and have fun already. But that's the worst thing that happens to you today about the B and B. I mean, I think that's the greatest thing you could ever have in your life. It's just uh, (laughs) you have to you you have your health, you have your friends, you're very Mm -hmm. successful. You're on a on a forward trajectory. I mean, you're a winner. So these are the sort of things, these are the small tests where you almost have to laugh at. It's it's almost like Bruce Lee. Mm-hmm. Remember when he went into the dojo and was beating up 30 people? He didn't beat up 30 in one shot, like in the Matrix where he's swinging around. It's really, <laughs> one, it's really one at a time. It's it's taking big piles into smaller mm-hmm. piles, holding and putting away. It's These are the sort of steps to make your life that much easier. So when the little stuff comes, you almost laugh at it. You, you almost thank it because the sour, then you know the sweet. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And it's interesting. I didn't anticipate getting into this story when we started recording, but basically like what happened with this Airbnb was that I had driven for 12 hours from Mm -hmm. Northern California up to Portland. And I was trying like, I mean, pedal to the metal with all of my stuff in my car, trying to beat sunset because I really wanted to unload before dark. That's just Mm -hmm. a preference of mine. It reduces injuries. Yay. Let's, let's unload before sunset. So I did get up here around eight o'clock at night. I got in, uh, I started, I unloaded the first like wagon full of stuff from my car and immediately noticed that this place has a smell to it, like a not great smell to it. But maybe I just need to air it out, turn on the air conditioner, whatever. Like sometimes places get dank if they've been shut up. So that's fine. I go get another load. I come back in, I'm looking for the air conditioner. I realize there's no air conditioner. There's no fans. There's only a heater there's not really any way to get the air circulating. And like, I'm developing a headache from like this moldy damp smell. So I Mm. actually wound up canceling everything and telling the host, like, I'm not going to be able to do five weeks here with a heat wave coming and this mold smell and no way to circulate the air. Um, And they tried to get me to stay, but I told them, you know, like, no, I I don't talk myself into staying places. That's just a personal rule of mine. Um, My gut says leave. I follow my gut. So had to fight with Airbnb long and short of it. But I mean, by the time I got to the hotel that night, it's already after midnight. I, I plugged in the wrong holiday in. I got to the front counter and I cried and the manager cried. And I'm just like at the epitome of frustration. Finally get checked into the right holiday in, get everything settled, get Stella set up, pass out. And thankfully I had the foresight to book two nights so that I wouldn't have to get up Sunday morning and just like rush like crazy, figure out where I'm going. I bought myself some more time because I knew that I needed to rest and that I was in such a mental state that nothing was going to be clear right now. And honestly, most of Sunday, I slept. I slept and I sat in the air conditioning and I looked up options and I tried to get a hold of Airbnb, but like that rest made the difference in everything. Cause just like wandering around the hotel, I'm like, oh, there's a hot tub. I'm gonna go research options sitting in the hot tub. tub. (laughs) Yeah. And that allowed me to tap back into that gratitude, like giving myself space to tie it back to what we were talking about earlier to give myself rest and realize, okay, things could definitely be worse. I'm sitting in a hot tub, exploring my options. I've got friends that are looking for places for me. Like this is actually a lot better than it might seem, even though yesterday I felt like the whole world was falling apart. (laughs) 
You need a couple little chinks in your arm or mm-hmm. you know, a couple of little war scars there, here and there. And so that's cool. It's going to be part of your funny story. You're mentioning it on the podcast. It's just one of those life. Ex- it's never going to happen again. That mm-hmm. I promise you're definitely going to be checking out these places. Oh, yeah. Well, and I mean, it. considering I've been on the road for two years and this is my first like not really not great experience with Airbnb. I, the, I like the odds. The odds have been going in our favor. So hopefully Airbnb learns from this and, and things are back on the upward trajectory. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just fascinating how like taking space, giving yourself rest, not reacting immediately can actually contribute to you being able to see the positive in a negative situation. I love it. 100% correct. Very smart. All right. I'm going to do an abrupt segue and I'm going to say, circle back to what we mentioned in the beginning with business sure. relationships and how uh-huh. sometimes things happen. And I feel like that's something that I encounter a lot with newer entrepreneurs who feel like they've always got to be perfect, always got to put their best step forward and that any mistake they make is either seen as a sign of weakness or a sign of incompetence. And it's, I remember stressing out like that in my early days of entrepreneurship. And then the further I've gone and the deeper the relationships I've gotten, I've realized how, okay, stuff happens. Exactly. Like you said, (laughs) I didn't really have a question there. uh, (laughs) The best relationships to build with a client are no surprises. Mm -hmm. In my industry, there is a rotation. So imagine, Angie, that one of your 10 agents doesn't come to work today and quits. I would let you know what happened, hopefully get an exit interview and explain why, give you the, the game plan of when we're bringing somebody on board and working with you. Because if it's a one and a done, if that's so delicate that it could be a deal breaker with a client, then by all means, walk on eggshells. But if you're capable in real time of having solutions and being accountable, you probably get a lot more seats and a lot more business because they realize you're a straight shooter mm-hmm. and you're not going to avoid to communicate with somebody. That's the worst thing you can do. And no one bats a thousand in business. What sort of entrepreneurs do these people think they are? Things happen all right? the time. Let the go of the profession. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on you on that. Like, no, I no, love- I'm glad you did. And as I'm saying, it's something that people shouldn't worry about. In fact, I don't want it to happen, but I look forward to it because there's always something that comes up. And when I immediately address it, Mm -hmm. then it just establishes more my credibility. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And just like you mentioned earlier, I love how this is coming full circle. Like you find out who people really are in times of crisis, in times of mistakes, when things are going wrong, that's who you find out who the people are around you that are going to step up, that are going to be leaders that you have these long relationships. Angie, those are real business people. Mm-hmm. If somebody comes to you with a solution and just takes the deep breath and just, you know, figures out what to do, that's the sort of pilot you want. It's not the first time they've been out at the high seas. Yep. And so you need to have a couple scrapes on the armor. Mm-hmm. It just shows that you've been out there a little bit. I love that. When I'm working with the the newer freelancers that I coach, I tell them there's actually power in calling out the elephant in the room. It's like, because... The client that you're talking to is looking over your shoulder going, are they going to mention the elephant? Should I mention the elephant? What is, what is that doing here? How are we going to deal with that? And I was like, so when you go, oh yeah, uh, by the way, there's an elephant there. Here's how we're going to deal with that problem. Uh, Let me know if you have any questions on that. I mean, I know that it's kind of weird that there's an elephant in here, but like, I've got a plan for that. Don't worry about that. Uh, Then they go, Okay, well, yeah, that's weird. There's an elephant in the room, but she's got it. It's fine. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Like, And I do that with products. I do that with clients all the time. Like, If there's a flaw in the product, I'll call out the flaw in the product and be like, is this 100% perfect? No. Is this pretty damn good? Absolutely. Here's why. Well, because you're in the now. People Mm -hmm. that don't address that elephant and just continue their pitching, they're just rehearsed and they're going through the motions. It's, you know, sometimes there's a stoplight or a detour. Or you just sit in Oasis for a while and have some rest and some water. Mm -hmm. And so I I allow things to happen at a natural pace. If you don't do a follow-up question, if you don't show active, attentive listening, copious Mm note-taking, confirmations, you're probably going to leave a door or two open and then you're not going to get the results you want at the end of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think communication is key. And it's, it's so interesting to me how many people are kind of paranoid to communicate. They're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing. They're afraid they're bothering people. They're afraid if they 
let you know the truth and tell you that the elephant is in the room and there's a problem that you're going to be upset with them for some reason. And I get that fear on the one hand, and I remember experiencing it in my lifetime. And, and I think that fear is valid, but flawed because exactly like you said, people respect a straight shooter. People want to be kept in the know and know what's going on. And even if you don't say it right, there are ways to kind of dampen that. Like one of my, I learned this trick from a very smart person named Annie Hyman Pratt, who does a lot of like team facilitation and his executive leadership training. Um, and she said, if you're really worried about not getting the words right, when you have to have a hard conversation, you can just say, I may not say this correctly, but I hope that you hear the spirit behind this, the intent behind that, and then say what you have to say in a kind and compassionate manner. And ever since I learned that and I put it into practice, I get so many people that tell me, man, you really have a way with words. Oh man, you know how to have hard conversations. Like, oh, your people management skills. And I'm like, it's one trick that I have just like, I hopped on that horse and rode it off into the sunset. And people are like, you're a great people manager. (laughs) And if they give you the luxury of time, if mm-hmm. they allow you to sleep on it, if you can write a draft and read it the next day, mm-hmm. there's a very good chance you can reset yourself, avoid sending the information, prioritize, practice. Mm-hmm. So you're not afraid or nervous because it's rehearsed. You realize certain words could, it's almost like speaking physics. Mm-hmm. Some things can produce positive or negative reactions. And so maybe instead of using the word help, you could say assist, guide, and lend a hand Mm -hmm. before saying something as you were doing earlier, saying, Angie, may I make a suggestion or in order for us to move forward? And so, listen, if you got to walk into that sort of situation, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing to do is to be prepared with as much diplomatic and strategic semantic vocabulary as possible. Yes. You have to do it. And so I would choose things that are always relentlessly positive mm-hmm. and, and, and showing some sort of sincerity doesn't mean I need to agree with you. Yes. But the last thing I want to do is provoke any sort of negative reaction mm-hmm. from you. So maybe we could take it in steps. Maybe we go to a certain point today, Angie, and go, why don't we do this, Angie? Why don't we speak tomorrow at the same time and we'll go to part two, part three, part four. Mm-hmm. As long as people can respect time, mm-hmm. not do a sense of urgency or force you in regards to impulse control, chances are you will come back, as you were mentioning, with a much better delivery that could produce the results that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. I love that you said that because I think that's something that really needs to be articulated and reinforced in this day and age of instantaneous expectation for communication, right? Like there are, I've seen folks and I've had clients that expected like me to be online answering questions all the time. And I would tell them, Hey, I I understand that. And with your employees, that might be company policy. It's not the way that I work with my business. I actually do my best work if I've got notifications off and I've carved out time to focus on this project. So, I mean, I can be in Slack answering pings all day if that's what you really want me to do. But my thought is you'd probably prefer me to be able to do the work that you hired me to do. Is that accurate? And they would always be like, man, wow. Okay. That was like a gracious no. (laughs) I'm not going to be in your Slack channel, but that being able to hold that boundary when I learned how to do that has just impacted so many other things for the positive in my life, because I learned that precisely. I don't need to respond the second somebody brings something to my attention. And in fact, responding the moment that they reach out without giving myself time to think often means that I am even in more danger of saying the wrong thing because I haven't thought about it. You lost all of your leverage, Mm -hmm. Angie, and they could potentially use something you say against you, even though it was, as you mentioned, misinterpreted, miscommunicated, or just at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that's fair. Hmm. I find that to be somewhat of manipulation. It really depends on the individual with whom you're speaking. Mm -hmm. But to me, I try to, especially if something's emotional Mm -hmm. or it's a very large decision, please allow me a moment to ponder. Yeah. Can I call Angie for a minute and talk to her about it so I can be calm and then get back in touch with you? I mean, those are the sort of support groups or best friends or even better, Angie. Imagine sharing it with a stranger so you have no sort of prejudgment or repercussion a bartender, a stranger, just to get it out Mm -hmm. and just to gauge a reaction. They don't even know you. 
Yeah. And I've been able to readjust myself by getting some sort of feedback from individuals that really have no, you know, financial interest in any sort of decisions I'm making. They're just there to listen as a friend or just somebody that cares for the moment. I love that. When that happens to me, I, I think I take a similar tactic, which is, hey, thanks for sharing that with me. Do you mind if I mull that over for, for a couple hours? I'm going to get back to you by this time. And I Perfect. just let them know I've I've heard you. I'm going to get back to you. I'm not leaving you hanging on red <laughs> so that you don't know what I'm thinking. You know that I've heard you and that I'm going to get back to you with what I think. And then the same thing. I have a certain number of friends uh, just a handful of people that I know I can call and say, all right. And it's funny because they can't see this. I've got my little timer here. I need to rant. Are you available to listen? Are you in the right headspace for this? Okay, cool. Thank you very much. I'm going to set a timer for 15 minutes. I get to say whatever the hell I want for 15 minutes. And then I got to pull it together and come up with an action plan. And that's really helped me a lot in situations where I'm feeling overwhelmed and stressed, just giving myself an outlet where it's okay to feel whatever I'm feeling, and then deep breath, action. <laughs> you have my permission to be uncomfortable physically. Mm -hmm. Like if you see a spider or snake or someone, you know, is running at you with a baseball bat, no problem. But yes. when, it, when it comes to mental challenges, I, I believe that people have the ability to control that and yes. to overcome yes. those situations. And a lot of it has to do is separating piles because hmm. it just seems like so much in the beginning. Yeah. And if you can start separating piles into smaller piles, it's, it's more manageable. It's almost like a divide and conquer, mm -hmm. but it seems like so much. Well, write it down. It's not that much. Oh, and then when goodness. you start putting sub dispositions, start crossing it out, mm -hmm. you laugh at it because it's not so tough. Uh -huh. come <laughs> and then you can almost, you can almost dominate it in a sense mm -hmm. to where you, you say you're, I'm not afraid anymore. It's mm -hmm. almost like Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump that was in that shrimp boat. He's up there on that mask, just yelling at the gods to strike him down, to pour rain on him. There's nothing that could affect him at that moment. It's almost like when you and I were dancing in the rain mm -hmm. and it's easier said than done. I, I, I can't, once again, make those decisions for people. But those are the sort of things that assisted me in visually looking at the sort of steps that needed to be taken or, or how cumbersome the, the, the project was. And when you really look at it and you really analyze it, each one has its own Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got a red button that could shut it off. Yes. Or just one domino can knock down the thousand. So what are you complaining about? Mm -hmm. You just got to crack that code, figure out where to focus. And then the next thing you know, an hour later, it's all done and you're ready for the next day. I love that you said that too, because you're, you're absolutely right. One domino can knock down a thousand and you never really know what that domino is, is or when it's going to happen. A uh, hello, global pandemic. So all you can really do on any given day is your best to keep this moving forward. That's all you can do. And if you've done that at the end of the day, your best. Uh, so I'm being specific. If you've done your best at the end of the day, even if your best is less than yesterday, but more than some other days, right? It fluctuates because we're human. Then that's a win in my book. Try again I tomorrow. I also believe that if you're put into a certain situation, you might have thought about something you would have never even considered before. Ooh, interesting. Dig into that a little bit deeper. Well, I mean, if you've, been ever broke mm -hmm. you realize how tasty a steak is and how it's nice to be under a roof next to a warm fire with a cup of tea mm -hmm. so if you ever get that again you appreciate it more yep or you might double check yourself on what got you into that sort of situation mm. there could be a time where the mask comes off and the individual that is attacking you or putting you in a certain position that makes you feel uncomfortable, you realize that they've crossed over a certain line or didn't respect sort of boundaries or didn't even bother to ask mm -hmm. about a certain protocol because you're asking you to communicate before the end of the business today. Well, I mean, your lack of preparation should never be my emergency. I want to cheer for that. They can't see me, but I'm like, I want exactly. that to be a, a motto of every business owner, every person out there. Just because you did not plan this does not make this an emergency on my part. I will do what I can 
no promises. <laughs> exactly. But but it gives you a chance, maybe almost like a video game where, you know, if Pac-Man dies, you have a couple more players and a couple more quarters. It's, you know, it's not a one and a done. So you you may be able to experiment in regards mm-hmm. to a difficult client, uh, um, you know, a certain target date. Mm-hmm. You know, when when a project is given to you only 45 percent complete mm-hmm. and you need to add the other, you know, 55 percent. And so uh, I, I don't mind being in a situation where I can challenge myself, mm-hmm. but I, I don't want to do anything to break myself. It's not your job to continuously test me because you don't trust me. That's mm-hmm. not fair. Yes. I mean, you, you can't judge me on what happened with your last client as I'm not judging you on my other clients. But let me put it this way. I've been in business long enough to know when someone has practiced their violin and when they're prepared. <laughs> and, and I love don't that start reverse psychology me on something that realistically cannot be done because I do own a call center and I do have infrastructure, but I, I'm more than willing to kick a tire or two or, or to look into something and just see how far our minds can go. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's very healthy sometimes. Yeah. Just, just to dabble into different colors in your crayon box, just to see what may come out of it. Yeah. Being a, a willing to experiment and go out of your comfort zone, but not necessarily uh, go against your own instincts or your own boundaries. I know I was talking with somebody recently about, let me see how I can do this in a, in a mostly anonymous way. Uh, they were struggling with a, a client that they were advising. And this client basically said, well, yeah, I made mistakes X, Y, Z, but you should have told me because you're the expert and I'm trusting you and that's what I'm paying you for. And this, my student said, well, but I told them not to do X, Y, Z. And so I, I do feel like I advised them in their best interest to the best of my capability. And I was like, yeah, I mean, maybe they weren't in a place to hear you. Maybe they missed that message or misunderstood it. So we can give them grace for being human while also telling them, okay, well, on date, I advised you not to do X, Y, Z. You felt that that was your best course of action and you did X, Y, Z. Now we're in this situation and I get that that is tough, but I did not in fact do X, Y, Z for your business. I like meeting minutes. Mm -hmm. It makes individuals accountable. Yeah. Maybe before the cure, two or three, not emails or even phone calls, but whatever it was to get that sort of response may need to be done. Yes. And as I say, you might need to find somebody else at that organization that has the decision maker's ear Mm -hmm. that might be more flexible, understanding, or takes the sort of notes when you make your suggestions Mm -hmm. and reads it back to you so everyone's on the same. I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, but they're just like myself. I have a floor supervisor Mm -hmm. and I have a chief tactical officer. I have individuals that assist me. And, and alleviate some of my workload and stress. Mm-hmm. And these owners try to wear so many hats. Oh, yes. And they want to do everything. Well, maybe you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. And possibly by comparing other clients you've had, other experiences where it has worked out or hasn't worked out, that could be a passive aggressive way to share with them your experience. Oh, which way? To give way? them that sort of indirect hint that mm-hmm. you shouldn't be doing it because I've seen it before. Oh, interesting. I didn't think about that. So wait, to clarify for my own uh, understanding, the way that I handled it was passive aggressive or are you talking about a, another one? No, no, the way I'm, we can. Oh, okay. And so instead of letting them know, well, you told me we did this and here's the result. Oh, no, no, no. Besides making this suggestion, I had a client X, Y, Z, twice your size that Mm -hmm. did this, this, and this, and this is what happened here, here, and here. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Or what are your thoughts about that? Or or could you expand on that for me on ways in which you think my client would have been able to resolve that issue? They might have figured it out, or they could have said, check me. No, you're correct. You painted yourself in a corner. I like and, that. That's demonstration in action versus saying, I don't advise you do X, Y, Z. Oh, okay. No. Here's a story about what happened the last time I did X, Y, Z. And I they just want to see give the crashed car. They, mm-hmm. they have to see the broken wine bottle. They, they have to see the stained dress mm-hmm. has to be done. And, and it's not like it's there and it, I'm letting you see 
that mm-hmm. I've seen this disaster in the past and can prove it yep. with statistics. So I'm letting you know that I don't bat a thousand. In fact, I'm sharing with you one of the, I still have them as a client, but look what happened with them. We took a few in the chin, Mm -hmm. still with me, but you need to see this because they've been with me longer than you, more experienced. They're a senior, you're a freshman. Mm -hmm. Let me explain to you what's happening throughout the couple of years of high school. So you yeah. have a better experience. I love that. That's I. That's how I work with a lot of my own clients. And my experience, X, Y, Z has not worked out the way that you're imagining. I understand why that is a fantastic idea. I share a story from my experience and I say, that said, how do you feel? What? How would you like to proceed? I'm here to help you succeed to the best of my ability. And the coolest thing I think I learned as an advisor, a trusted advisor to people is that I consider my duty fulfilled if I had adv- have advised them and I am looking out after their best interest. And then if they dec- decide to proceed against my advice, I'm still going to help them. And oh, this circles back so nicely. Like we talked about in the beginning, the business relationships, if it goes wrong, well, then I'm going to be there to help them pick up the pieces and figure out how to move forward. And if it goes right, well, hey, that didn't go like I expected, but yay, win. All right, cool. Let's keep moving forward. Like either way, me looking after them and their best interest by providing the advice. Oh, that ties back to what you were saying about being a friend too. Like a friend will tell you like it is because they care about you and they want you to do better. So I've shared my best advice. And if you proceed, cool. All right. I'm going to let you proceed how your gut tells you to proceed. And then I will be here for better or for worse after everything shakes out the way it's supposed to. Think of ice cream scoops. Mm -hmm. Ethically, it's okay. I'll sell you five scoops, but I'll let you know that if you move a little bit, they may fall. I mean, I've never seen, I've seen a triple scoop and no one does five, but I'm just letting you know, if you're good with it and you you hold center, you might be able to pull it off, but there Mm -hmm. is still a risk there. And I'm still ethically comfortable selling it to you because you're very insistent Yes, and it's okay. I, I think there's a way to meet in the middle and wish them well. I love that. I think that a lot of, business stress, contractor stress, consultant stress stems from this issue that we're kind of circling talking about, which is trying to do more than you can, like stepping over the line of your business into someone else's business and attempting to run it for them the way that you would run their business versus you staying in your lane where you're strong. There's so many parallels here where you were talking about hiring support staff so that you can stay in your lane where you're strong. Like you started your business because you have this interest or this passion or this expertise and you want to help people with that. And that's really where your lane is and in your sweet spot. You can't actually jump into other people's businesses and run all of their businesses for them in addition to running your own. That's a recipe for burnout. I just wish I may be able to change certain company cultures. Yes. When I've worked with clients in the United States, they have an overzealous supervisor that likes to curse Ooh. and they'd like to type in, you know, bold caps, which thinking they're making a, a statement, but it could be offensive. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the things that you may do in the United States, let's say New York, for an example, in a boiler room might not be a good fit here. And plus mm-hmm. sometimes clients don't respect the labor laws. And so mm-hmm. um, at least I could try to make certain suggestions in regards to my company culture, how I interact with the agents, how I respect them and give them their dignity and their job stability and play pinball with them and work (laughs) on their soft skills and have an open door policy. And I'm not looking to fire Mm -hmm. an individual because a lot of clients are like, yeah, let's just get rid of him and bring, no, no, no. Because you're talking about my reputation in Costa Rica. I I just don't want to feel used Mm -hmm. And, and you're back in Chicago. Yeah, You never see these people, but I might bump into them at the mall on Saturday. And I just want to make sure that I'm cool with this agent and his family (laughs) so Mm -hmm. I can say hello to his mother. And and so to me, nothing's worth that price. I'm not going to sell my soul for a golden fiddle. I'm not going to compromise my ethics or do something illegal or gray area. I've been here for 15 years, 15 years before you even came with me. Mm-hmm. So why would I want you now? I mean, it's either either join my happy rhythm or potentially we're not a good fit. I'm not going to yes. be a fall guy or, or that sort of individual. I'm sorry. I Thankfully, Angie, I, I, I don't need that business mm-hmm. in order to keep my lights on yes. or in order for me to, you know, to make a payroll. Mm-hmm. So I've never had to do things like that before. 
And I usually turn down more clients than I accept them. I'd love to grow to thousands of seats, but I have to make sure I can fulfill the need of the client and the agent, and especially myself. That's mm-hmm. the most important. Oh, I love that you were saying all of this. Like the the phrase popped into my head while you were explaining that of uh, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything. Uh, and I feel like that is a danger zone that happens in business, right? Like uh, I need to make the bills, and this guy seems like he's on the level with their business, and then you get involved and you take their money, and they're doing a whole bunch of shady, unethical stuff that makes you really uncomfortable. And now you're kind of in that world, and it's hard to extricate yourself because you need money. Like it. It can be a trap to fall you into never that. Be there in the first place. Exactly. Like if you know what you stand for, and you say, "I work with people who have a passion and a vision, and they really care about their customers, and they want to achieve some good in the world." Well, then you're probably not going to fall for that shady guy that has the scammy thing because you know who you are for. Love it, and I love. And I want to point this out because I want to shine a spotlight on it. I think that you do this so brilliantly. And I hope everybody emulates your example, because this is something that I it drives me nuts about American corporate culture, that we think that we can discipline people into wanting to give their best to the company, that we can Mm. micromanage them into wanting to give their best. I think your approach is better. Like, I care about this person and their family. I care about their success. How can I train them? How can I develop them? Even if they're not going to stay here for the rest of their lives, how can I have a positive impact on their life? and therefore the community, and then they want to bring in other people to work. And this is a great place. Like, I think that I just, if I could put that on a bat signal over New York and just be like, treat your coworkers with respect, treat your employees with respect. But you're supposed to fear your boss. Mm, And you're supposed to be afraid of being fired. I don't buy it. And you're trying to get the best out of somebody by by forcing them to push a rock up a hill. I think that's terrible. I I realize this because there's a large rotation within call centers. Let's be realistic here. Mm-hmm. I usually lose someone, Angie, because of natural attrition, a scheduling conflict, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a best friend working somewhere closer to home, or sometimes even money. Sometimes it's merit. Mm-hmm. But um, I think the greatest thing as a leader, and I'm gonna say the word again, is, is dignity. The fact that I know somebody's name, I also work in their shoes. I have sat in a cubicle. I've made and received these calls. I understand what it's like. So I can extend empathy towards them. Mm. But I know that when you create an environment where you sincerely invest in somebody, and for me, it was quite easy. Since English is their second language, I had an angle. Mm. I could focus on their grammar vocabulary, similes, delivery, genres in the United States, experiences. So I came to the table with something. Mm -hmm. And so I guess by focusing on that uh, return on investment from their education and their own self-fulfillment, almost letting, allowing them to be selfish, Mm -hmm. to, to use me, to get better English skills, more, you know, become more marketable. That's great because if you feel that way, it's only going to roll over into your work. (laughs) So as as long as you're more confident that way, besides even work, it's probably going to make your life better outside of the office. And so I had a special sauce Mm -hmm. that I literally focused on. Business was second. Mm -hmm. Self-development was first. And And it was good enough for people to buy it mm-hmm. and for the for the agents to decide to choose my call center mm-hmm. over Amazon and the other larger call centers because they, they knew that they had a mentor mm-hmm. and this was an environment where they would be increasing their skills and not become complacent and, and bored. And that's why it's kind of funny. It's almost like the Dirty Dozen or the Justice League. <laughs> I really do have a unique set of individuals here that are not looking to get lost amongst thousands Mm. and and, and just go their way. These are individuals that want to make a name for themselves to, to know an owner and to have the opportunity through merit to grow. Yes. And it's very funny because we all have that in common. These individuals here are so humble and kind. And I hear stories all the time of agents breaking bread outside of the office on their own free time. Mm -hmm. And that warms my heart because individuals from many different departments, men and women alike, 
just going there to, to have some barbecue and some laughs and to share what they have in common, which is me. Yeah. <laughs> I was able to bring them together. <laughs> and so I think that's one of the greatest things that we've created, Angie. I think we've that's created fantastic. that sort of environment. Yeah. Like I, you know, when I became a copywriter, I went in house for a while to stabilize the finances. I, I told you that story about living in my car before I got my first copy job. And so I spent what several years. What car was it, by the way? I what, had what a, kind of car were you having? a Suzuki XL7. <laughs> oh, rock on. There you go. It was it was pretty nice. It's a little small SUV. It was nice and comfy. I had my diabetic cat with me. We're noticing a theme to the travel. I always take the cat of the hour. Uh, and of course, they can't see the video. I'm pointing over my shoulder at Stella, who's like curled up in an observer position as we're recording this. Um, but when I wound up in the final salaried copywriter role that I would occupy in my time as a as a writer, uh, I was in a very toxic corporate environment. And I'm grateful for the experience, too. I wouldn't change it if I had the opportunity to go back because that taught me so much about leadership and the kind of leader I refuse to be. I refuse to be one that is seeking glory uh, on the backs of my people's hard work. I refuse yep. to be the one that intimidates people into staying versus inspires them to want to stay. I refuse to be the person that asks them to give up their life for the business. I like there were just so many great things that I learned about. I can't intimidate them into doing their best. I can inspire them to do their best though. Mm. Change the way I do everything. They could always quit and then look at that sort of investment, swing and a miss. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's it costs real money to train somebody, to invest them, to create systems around them. And then I don't think you're just doing yourself and the whole company a disservice if you're trying to control everybody. <laughs> Can only control you, boo. Might and as I've well. done some Philly guilt before. I, I've said, hey, Angie, you know you're better than this. Come on. I saw you do 14 last week. Or Angie, you seem out of character. You're usually smiling, having a great day. You're not talking to anybody. And mm -hmm. that's been... But I think that's compassion. I don't know that that's guilt. I think that's hasn't leading worked with every time, though. Mm -hmm. There have been certain people that found that offensive or mm -hmm. they didn't know how to react to it where someone not called them out, but observed something that I brought to their attention. Mm -hmm. Maybe they weren't mature enough or ready yeah. to get to that next level because a lot of the excuses are, are you know, more about themselves than in regards to my efforts to make them better. Yeah. And so I try to learn with this new generation through this vertical, being a business owner and a guest in another country, really what is the right message to share with someone that might be having issues outside the office or potentially not feeling prepared that day. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of strange like that, but I, I like to give people, if, if as long as you're not breaking a labor law, yeah. second and even third chances, mm -hmm. because you and I have been given multiple chances. Yes. Thank God we have, because we've, we've been given that opportunity to make right Yes. And to correct on those mistakes. And, okay. and I think that's the best way for personal growth. Yeah. I think like that's the part that I wish I had realized earlier in my entrepreneurial journey is that so many people who have reached a certain level of success feel compelled by, uh, they even talk about it as a compulsion. Most of the people I know to turn around and help the people behind them step up because yes. someone in front of them helps them step up and they could, they recognize that they could not move forward without that perspective, without that mentorship, without that guidance, without that grace for being human and understanding that you're going to mess it up. Nobody's going to get it perfect from the time that they started. I've made this joke before, like you didn't come out of the womb as boss baby. Nobody, like you're not a six month old executive in a suit who already runs a successful business. You're going to have to have some moments where you're learning how to walk and you fall down flat on your face. And man, isn't it great when you've got someone there that goes, wow, I bet that hurt. Come on. It's okay. Step up here. Let me help you. Let's get up. It's okay. Here's, here's how to do that better next time. And then that's just so empowering. I love it. I'll share something funny with you. Like yeah. I walk the rows and an agent might be yawning that morning and I'll stop. I go 6.5. And you'll look at me and go 6.5. <laughs> I go, Angie, you're supposed to open your mouth more, lift your head back, put your arms out and stretch your back. If you're going to do it, give me a swan dive yawn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a weak yawn. 
6.5. And everyone starts laughing. So then the next time I see them, they over exaggerate a yawn. And I go, and there you go. If you're mm-hmm. going to do it, do it right. I love that. Heaven forbid we build workplaces where people have fun, laugh, enjoy themselves, are that much more productive because they're just having fun and not like constantly staring at the clock and anxious and worrying about whether they're producing the right amount. Like, mm. yes. I love this. I and, feel and like I, I even I- caught the occasional person sleeping. All right? <laughs> it, it's not the, and so I walk up to, you know, I go, Angie, you're like, ah, I go, you got to calm down. You're bothering everybody. Ah, <laughs> you're too excited. Laughing. Yeah. What am I going to do? Write you up? I mean, mm-hmm. if it happens once in a blue moon, you're you're exhausted. Yeah. You're working so hard. Your numbers are great. I don't know if something happened. You you fell asleep for a second, but mm-hmm. instead of firing you or walk of shame or embarrassing, I'll make a funny joke. Obviously, it's not going to happen again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will whisper to you, yo, Angie, why don't you go put some water on your face real quick? Yeah. And that's the cool boss. That's that's giving you the whole pass. Mm-hmm. The dignity. You're not in trouble. You're not in trouble. Yeah. But I'm letting you know I'm watching you. <laughs> It's that, well, it's that dignity that you mentioned. It's like, I, I, um, I have a friend who's a psychotherapist and she mentioned that too. Like the root of so many arguments and disagreements that wind up blowing up is because no one has a dignified way to back out. And it's like, once you are entrenched and there's no way to preserve your dignity, well, I might as well go all the way into the mud now. Cause we're already, dirt- <laughs> like we t- I'm already wet. Might as well dance in the rain. But if you can give somebody like that understanding, that compassion, and their dignity, then things tend to de-escalate a lot more often than they escalate. Listen, my good friend, if it's not my immediate family, my wife, or some of my best friends, these aren't deal breakers. I could yep. almost allow you to get it out. Mm-hmm. Then ask you, you finished yet? You yep. still done? <laughs> I'll let you go. And then what will happen is I will walk backwards, address everything you do in a calm and cool way. Mm-hmm. Usually by the end of that conversation, we're both apologizing to each other because of our tone mm-hmm. and things like that. And so now, Angie, I, it's, it's very rare for me to go code red. Yeah. You might just be having a moment. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to gauge you on the 99 other times. Not this one time. And uh, let's just see where you go with this today, Angie. Just don't scratch my car, please, or do something stupid. I know. But everything else, you could yell, scream, curse, and kick a tire. I'm cool with that mm-hmm. as long as you like, okay? Because that might actually, something might happen there where I've even seen people shed a tear and it's not even work-related. It's just so much in their life living with multi-generational families and taking care of parents and grandparents could be overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And so somebody might get out and then they're embarrassed and I let them know it's cool. Let them know that it's something that we're not going to discuss with anybody else because I respect your privacy. Mm-hmm. And then they go, I never expected my boss to be like that. I go, I'm not just a boss. My name is Richard Blank and I am a man mm-hmm. and, I, and I understand these things. And then that's the individual that will never leave Mm -hmm. your company. Not like I have leverage over them or something to embarrass them in the future. But there's that sort of look that an individual will give to me and I will look back. Well, we know we've been there. Mm -hmm. We've done that. And I'm cool with you. And so they become even more relaxed and comfortable and contribute even more with mm-hmm. other individuals that they see that might be going through that sort of situation. And so I planted a lot of those positive seeds in multiple areas of the call center with individuals that have gotten through situations with me. And so um, I allow them to speak for us as well, Angie. I love that. And I think that's like the perfect note to wrap on because I think Human first is like sums up everything that we are talking about today. Human first, care about your people first and invest in those relationships because those are what's going to pay dividends rather than trying to short stocks and all the crazy stuff. Like invest in the people around you. Give a damn about the people around you. Lift up the people around you. Watch how you shine. Mm. And I wish I was smart enough to do stocks or cryptocurrency (laughs) and stuff like that. But, But you're right. You and I go old school. Mm -hmm. We build relationships and that is still a way to build a sandcastle and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm more than willing to do it that way. Yep. 
I, that's my preferred way to do it. I love it. So tell us a little bit more about your business, how we can learn about you. You can buy a plane ticket, fly down and come visit me <laughs> in Central America. Bring Stella, of course. She would yes. love Rica. And you can give me a call, 888-271-6750. My email address is CEO at Costa Rica's call center.com. And Angie, I got a very large Facebook fan page, close to 100,000 local Costa Rican Ticos. And if your audience is interested in learning about the business process outsourcing industry in Costa Rica, you will see that we're north of Panama, south of Nicaragua, the only democratic society in Central America. So there's no standing Mm. army. We have a 95% literacy rate. They put all their money back into education. Mm. We have an incredible infrastructure. So companies such as Amazon, HP, Intel, and Oracle are here. Costa Rica is known for medical tourism and especially eco-tourism. We have some of the best surfing in the world, waterfalls, zip lining, butterflies, monkeys, iguanas. Oh. You name it. We're known for Pura Vida, which is translated over to pure life. Mm-hmm. And so we're very much into nature and mm. it's a beautiful culture. And those that have been to Costa Rica find themselves and also lose themselves. And so <laughs> that's my recommendation for you and your amazing permission to kick ass audience. I love that. Looking up tickets to Costa Rica right away. Thank you so much for coming on the show, for recording with me twice. I'm going to find a way to release that first 20 minutes like that. Uh That was so genius. And I'm so glad that we got to record again. Thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing all of your wisdom and insight. I appreciate you. Pleasure was mine, Angie. Thank you very much. So that is it. Another awesome episode of Permission to Kick Ass on the Books. If you want to know more about the show, if you want to know more about me, Angie Coley, and the mission I'm on to help entrepreneurs punch fear in the face and do big, bold things, then head on over to permissiontokickass.com. That is all one word together, permissiontokickass.com. Make sure to sign up for my email list so that you know whenever there's a hot, fresh, and ready podcast episode out for you. And also on Mondays, I like to send out a little newsletter called Kick Monday's Ass. I'm sure you're totally, totally surprised by that. So thank you for being here with me today. I'm Angie Coley. Make sure that you share this with a friend that needs to hear this message today. Like it, share it, comment wherever you're listening to this today. And let's go kick some ass.